Happy Mother's Day. Usually I, I get the same to you, but I didn't get that this time. That's all right. I'm okay with that. It's good to see you here this morning. Uh, everyone looks a little damp. I have no control over that. You'll have to take that up with God up, up above. But uh, it looks like we're going to have another rainy week ahead. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please have your hand a blessing upon all the women in our church, uh, the women that are so uh, special to us, those that work so hard uh, to help others in need, those who are mothers, those who uh, are, are mothers to someone in their lives. Lord, be with them. May you have a, uh, just bless them on this day set aside for them. Uh, Lord, bless us all as we open the word of God together. May we have sweet fellowship as we do so. And Lord, just uh, be with us. Thank you for all you've given us, all you've done for us, especially the great sacrifice of love, of sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. We are ever, ever so grateful for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The song is Sweet Hour of Prayer. There are two verses in your bulletin. It's also in your hymnal on page number 439. hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, that calls me from a world of care, and bids me at my Father's throne, make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escape the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless. And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word and trust his grace, I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. And amen to that. At this point, we're going to have Miss Linda Campbell come forward and lead us in our unison reading. It comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 2, just three verses, 9 through 11. And please stand if you're able and comfortable standing as Linda leads us in this reading. And when he, he had spoken, spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. This coming Thursday, May the 13th, in religious circles, is known as the Day of Ascension. For those of you who are new to all this church stuff, what is that? What is the Day of Ascension? Well, the Day of Ascension is the 40th day after Easter Sunday. And the book of Acts tells us that after his resurrection, Jesus walks on the earth for 40 days. He didn't just disappear after he arose. He actually was very busy for that month and 10 days. And during this 40-day time, our resurrected Lord is seen by over 500 people, according to the Bible. Well, Easter this year fell on April 4th. 40 days after Easter would be this Thursday, May the 13th. First, let me say, it's hard for me to believe that nearly 40 days have passed since Easter Sunday. It really does feel like that was just last week. 
Second, I find myself in a bit of a quandary this morning, as I do most Mother's Days. As a, a pastor, I want today's lesson to be about the Ascension. But being that today is Mother's Day, I also have to... Uh, I'd also like to bring a lesson dealing with the ladies in our church, those who I just cannot be without. Well, believe it or not, I think I can divide my focus this morning. I have two, two, two lessons in one, and here it goes. You know the story. Jesus dies on the cross. He is laid in the tomb. He rises three days afterward. But this is not the end. Our resurrected Lord walks on this earth in his renewed body. Hundreds of people witnesses, with, wit, witness him. And many unbelievers come to believe, and many believers have their faith renewed. But once again, Jesus' time on this earth is short. He will not remain here forever. He is back due in heaven to take his rightful place beside God the Father. Now, how will he make his exit this time? On a boat? No. On the back of a donkey? No. Buried in a tomb? No. This time instead, he will ascend into heaven. That must have been quite a sight. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus gives his final instructions to his 11 remaining disciples. Remember, Judas has hung himself at this point. The disciples, he tells them, are not to leave Jerusalem. Instead, they are to wait until God the Father sends them the Holy Spirit. Jesus leaves them with this sign. Jesus promises the men that they will be baptized in the Holy Spirit, whatever that means. The men hadn't heard of any such thing up until this point. I mean, the Spirit of God has always been a factor in their ministering. But what does it mean to be baptized in Him, in the Holy Spirit? And the disciples will just have to wait and see what this means. And we'll all have to wait and see for two Sundays when we talk about this on the day of Pentecost. But anyway, as usual, the disciples entirely miss the point of what Jesus is saying. They ask Jesus if and when he is going to restore the kingdom of Israel here on earth. And Jesus tells them, what? I, I, I'm not talking about that. What are you talking about? Hey, listen, you guys, you needn't bother worrying about such earthly things. You have heavenly duties to do. They don't need to know the time and the seasons of those things which only God the Father controls. Jesus tells them that their only concern is to do what he is instructing them to do at this point. They are to stay in Jerusalem and wait. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit, and then afterward they are to be witnesses for him. And Jesus promises that they will understand what he's talking about in due time. And after giving these final instructions, Jesus begins to rise off the ground, and, it, and he is leaving his men for the second and final time. And he is taken up into a cloud as the disciples watch. And they're all staring up at the sky. And they don't know what to do next. They just keep staring and staring up into the sky. They can no longer see him. They keep standing there with their chins pointed upward. Uh, staring at nothing, trying to make out, what just, did you, did you see that? What just occurred? What just happened? What do we do next? What else? And they're standing there waiting for something else to happen. And while the disciples are looking upward, all 11 of them, and by the way, that's a great prank. If you ever just walk into a store, walk into some place, and just look upward, you'll get everybody in the store looking up. <laughs> anyway, while the disciples are just standing there looking upward, two men dressed in white appear, standing beside them. And these two angelic-looking men ask the disciples, why are they just standing there look, looking up at nothing, looking up at the sky? And the disciples, of course, you know, they, they drop their chins down to eye level, and they quickly snap their heads back, and uh, the two men explain that Jesus has been taken up into heaven. Well, if nothing else, we just learned something. Heaven is that way, okay? That's where heaven is. So the two men uh, explain that Jesus was taken up into heaven. The two men in white then leave the men with a sign. They promise that one day Jesus will return in the same manner. You guess that the two men in white are angels or messengers from God. And the angels then disappear and the disciples go on their way. They're very obedient. They go to Jerusalem and they wait. They wait. One day passes, two days pass, five days, a week. Ten days later, nothing has happened. No Holy Spirit no further word from Jesus, nowhere else to turn. The 11 disciples decide to hold a prayer meeting in an upper room. 
Now this could very well be the same upper room where the disciples had their last supper. We don't know that, but the, the logic would dictate that. The 11 men are joined by 109 other believers. The Bible says there were 120 believers in all. This must have been a, a rather large upper room to hold 120 people. But what a picture of unity. 120 followers, believers, Christians, all huddled together, all praying that the Lord's will be done, all praying for the Lord to show them what to do next. Now what happens next as they're praying there? Well, you'll have to come back two weeks to the, when we celebrate the day of Pentecost. But being this is Mother's Day, we're going to switch our focus in this upper room to one particular person. Sitting and waiting and praying with the others uh, is one particular woman. Acts chapter 1 gives us a short list of some of the 120 people in this upper room that morning at this prayer meeting. And it says this, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zealots, and Judas the brother. This is another Judas. There was Judas Iscariot. This is Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Acts 1 mentions one specific woman who is among the 120 believers, and that woman is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Let's all picture Mary sitting there in that upper room with the rest of them, waiting and praying. She has been through so much. No one would have blamed her if she had gone into hiding. No one would fault her if she had skipped this prayer meeting to process everything she has gone through. No one could blame Mary if she had been done with this whole business. But no, Mary sits there actively praying for the Lord, who is also her son, to show her what he has in store for her and for the others to do next. As she prays, I wonder what, if anything, is going through her mind. You know, she's been on quite a wild emotional roller coaster. Uh, it was just a month and a half prior when she witnessed her beloved son hanging on that cross, dying for the sins of the world. He was so beaten, his visage was so marred that he was unrecognizable to everyone except her. A mother just knows. Yet she, knowing her son was innocent of any sin, stood there as the crowd mocked him. She's been through a lot. Then, just as she was beginning to come to terms with her son's brutal death, he rises from the tomb. Of course, she was delighted to see him. The mother's pain of her, this mother's pain of her son's death would have been eclipsed by the joy of his resurrection. And her son then spends 40 days with her and the others, only to disappear in the clouds. Now, 10 days have passed, nothing, no word. What is she thinking? What is going through her mind? I wonder, perhaps she is thinking back on another time when she thought she had lost him and she would never see him again. The time she lost track of him in the temple when he was 12 years old. Not far from where she is sitting in this upper room, most likely. It was then that when Jesus told his mother that he must be about his father's business. Perhaps Mary is remembering even 12 years before that. Uh, remembering Simeon's words when she and Joseph took baby Jesus into the temple for the first time. Simeon warned her, he warned her, that one day uh, it would feel like a sword was piercing through Mary's soul so the thoughts of many hearts would be revealed. And perhaps Mary is even flashing back nine months before that to the very beginning when the angel Gabriel appears to her to tell her to fear not. Gabriel does so in an effort to comfort her as he delivers this good news of her surprise pregnancy. Mary didn't realize it then, 30 years, 30, as she's sitting in that upper room, but 33 years prior, the advice of Gabriel to fear not would need to last her an entire lifetime. Mary no doubt lived in fear uh, where her son was concerned for his entire life. She feared for him because she knew he was different. She feared for him every time the powers that be would oppose him. Uh, she feared every time his aggressors picked up stones to stone him. I'm sure that Mary had to choke down her fear time and time and time again. I have said this often, but I don't think, uh, I've said this often, I think it bears repeating, but we don't give Mary her proper due. We just don't. She was quite a woman and quite a mother. 
But at a, at a point where she could have been done, at a point where she has already done more for the cause of Christ than any other woman or ever, any other man for that matter would ever do, at a point where she has given all of herself and sacrificed everything in her life for Christianity, she sits with the others, thinking herself no better than the others, and she prays, Lord, show us what to do next. Mary could have been done. She could have been out, yet she prays for more. Now, if this isn't the penultimate picture of a good mother, I don't know what would be. You know, good mothers are indestructible. No matter what we kids throw at them, they rarely walk away. No matter what emotional roller coaster they have been on, good mothers will willingly get back on that same roller coaster in lieu of abandoning their children. Good mothers want to be there to the end. You know, Mary has taken a few punches in her life, yet she gets up. For the next round ready to do what she can for the cause of her for the cause of christ the cause of her son and with that we'll close the story we'll pick this up in two weeks and with that have a happy mother's day let's move on With my soul, 
It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. At this point, we're going to have a, some excerpts read from, uh, uh, responsively read from Proverbs 31, which has come to know, be known as a, a very good passage about being a righteous woman. I'm going to ask a righteous woman I know, Mrs. Star Ackerman, to come forward to lead us in this reading. Please stand if you're comfortable and able. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. Strength and honor are her clothing. And she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. Give her of the fruit of her hands. And let her own works praise her in the gates. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you, Mrs. Ackerman. You know, there are many, many stories and passages in the Bible that tell and deal with motherhood. And I'm going to tell you one of my favorite motherhood stories this morning from the Bible. In fact, it's such a favorite of mine, I'm afraid I tell it too often. So I checked my notes, and the last time I talked about this was six years ago. So if you haven't been here, if you weren't here six years ago, this will be new stuff to you, maybe. And, and if you were here six years ago, what well, doesn't hurt for you to hear it again? Here it goes. Today's sermon is about two mothers. Now, these two mothers aren't righteous or even well-known in the Bible. In fact, the Bible doesn't even tell us their names. Uh, these two mothers have a lot in common. They live in the same house. Uh, they uh, are of the same dubious profession. They are involved in the same sin, and they both have a child the same age. But these two women have very, one very important attribute which separates them, but we'll get to that later on in our lecture. These two women aren't the star of our story today. The major character is the story, the major character of our story is King Solomon. Solomon is the son of King David from his wife Bathsheba. Now Solomon is a very wise man. He's a wise king. He has his faults. Mainly he has his father's roaming eye for the ladies. And then some, but as we often see, great men have great faults. Solomon is known as the wisest man who has ever lived. And as an example of his great wisdom, God made sure that this story was in the Bible as, a, as, a, as evidence to his godly wisdom to show us how truly wise Solomon was. Now, why was Solomon so wise? Well, late one night, the Lord appears to Solomon in a dream and promises that he will give Solomon anything, any one thing he desires. Now, Solomon could have asked for a long life or great wealth or dominance over his enemies. But instead, Solomon asks for godly wisdom so that he can be a good king for God's people. Well, the Lord, recognizing Solomon's sincerity, not only gives him the great wisdom he requests, the Lord also gives him a long life, great riches, and superiority over his enemies, the things which he could have asked for, but he did not. Anyway, let's get back to our story. During King Solomon's reign were two women. Two women from his kingdom come to see him. They have a dispute. The, women, the Bible describes these women, women as prostitutes. Now, I'm not slamming them. That's what the Bible describes them as. Anyway, it is doubtful that King Solomon made it, made it a habit of hearing the disputes of such common, well, we used to call them street hostesses. I don't know what you call them. That would be like our president presiding over jaywalking ticket hearings. But anyway... I can only think of two reasons why the great, mighty King Weiss, King Solomon, the king of Israel, would be called in to settle a dispute among two such common women. Number one, perhaps these women are influential and not as common as we first think. We're not really told, but maybe they're the personal staff of uh, some dignitary or even Solomon himself. I mean, after all, don't forget, I said Solomon is a great man with great faults, and this was one of his faults. Anyway... If these working girls serve the upper crust of the kingdom, perhaps they have enough clout to be granted an audience with the king. But the second reason, and most likely this is the true reason, but I don't know that. These two ladies appear in front of King Solomon because the lower courts simply don't have any wisdom to settle this dispute. 
Maybe these ladies went to their local arbitrator and he couldn't come up with an answer. They said they went to the, the next, the, maybe the district court and the district justice couldn't come up with an answer. And so these women have worked their way up the legal ladder until they get to their last stop, King Solomon, to uncover the truth. Whichever, these two ladies have a puzzling disagreement. Only the wisest man in the kingdom can solve their problem. Only King Solomon can solve their problem. It, th it seems that these two ladies live in the same house. These two ladies uh, are pregnant at the same time. These ladies deliver each other's babies, and the babies are born mere days apart. Other than the ladies themselves, there is no one else witnessing these births. There are no midwives, no, no family, no husbands to speak of. Being that these ladies are left alone to fend for themselves during this very vital time of delivery, we can assume that these ladies have been put away privately. It was Jewish custom to hide away women who had gotten themselves in trouble through not so honorable means. I mean, remember, we even see this in the New Testament when Joseph finds out that his virgin wife-to-be, his supposedly virgin, virgin wife-to-be, is found with child, he decides to put her away privately. But thankfully, Joseph later decides to raise the baby as his own. But that's another sermon. Let's get back to this one. This is just conjecture. We don't really know. But being that these ladies live in the same house, perhaps they're, perhaps they're being kept by the same man. It might be that these babies are fathered by the same fella. And if so, then these babies would be half-brothers and maybe they look alike. Maybe they're hard to tell apart. Anyway, the babies each sleep with their mothers in, the same, in their mother's beds. And during the night, and this is horrible and awful, and oh my goodness, I can't imagine, one mother rolls over and accidentally ugh, suffocates her baby. That's terrible. And even though this first woman will prove to be the villain in their story this morning, I can't help but feel terrible for her. What a horrible, traumatic thing to happen. Just awful. Anyway, waking up and realizing what has happened. And she's probably out of her mind with grief. She does something despicable. She walks over to the other woman's bed. And while the second woman is sleeping, the first woman carefully removes the living baby and trades that baby for her dead baby. And then she walks away. In other words, she does the old switcheroo, as we call it. Morning comes. The second mother awakens, recognizing that this baby in her arms, the dead baby, is not her baby. A mother just knows. Immediately, she's up to speed. Immediately, she knows what the other woman did, that she knows what has taken place. Now, each woman is claiming that the living son is hers. In a day before DNA testing, each mother insists that the dead son belongs to the other woman. And who is to say which woman is lying? King Solomon is to say. Let me stop there. Let me say this. I am fascinated. I have weird, odd fascinations with the Bible. And I'm fascinated by pairs in the Bible. I'm not talking about like twins, like Esau and Jacob born to the same parents. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about pairs in the Bible who are pairs of people who are almost identical. They are identical except for one characteristic or one misfortune which separates them. The thieves on the cross are a great example. Here are two men more or less identical. Both thieves are being punished at the same time, most likely for the same crime. But one is slightly different than the other because one sees Jesus Christ as a con man and a criminal, and the other sees him as an innocent man and the son of God. Then there's Abel and Cain, the sons of Adam and Eve. Both have the same parents, both live in the same uninhabited world, uh, and both have firsthand knowledge of God Almighty. Yet one is obedient to the Lord, and while the other is jealous and wrathful towards his brother, so much so that he kills him. I think of the two Pharaohs in the Bible, the one at the end of the book of Genesis and the one at the beginning of the book of Exodus. You know, both men come from the same families. Both men are wealthy and very powerful. And both men have absolute rule in Egypt. But the Genesis Pharaoh has a respect and a fear of the God of Joseph. The Pharaoh in Exodus has zero regard for Jehovah and he enslaves God's people. You know, the Bible even says in the end times, there'll be two men walking, one will be taken and one will be left behind. Two women will be milling grain together, one will be taken and one will be left behind. And now in 1 Kings 3, we see two very, very similar women, but with one difference. One is telling the truth and one is lying. 
King Solomon is facing a very difficult choice. These ladies have brought confusion to his kingdom. And 1 Corinthians tells us that God is not the author of confusion. It has been my experience that when you have confusion, then the devil's usually behind it. God is not the author of confusion. God makes everything clear. These ladies bring confusion to the king, and it's Solomon's job to rid this confusion and bring clarity to the situation. Now Solomon, having the wisdom God has given him, knows that one of these ladies has to be lying. There can't be an alternate truth. One lady is lying and one lady is telling the truth. He also knows that this lady has perpetuated this lie, who knows for how long, until you know, at least a few days, maybe a few months, until they got an audience with him. So he knows the longer you lie about something, the harder your heart becomes. He has to play on this. If he can expose the woman with the hard heart, he will expose the liar and expose the fraudulent mother. Solomon devises a plan. 1 Kings 3, 24-25 says, And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought him a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child into two and give half to one and half to the other mother. Now, that would have worked if it was like a million dollars or a piece of land but if you divide a baby, there's no baby. You understand that. And Solomon's court must have thought he had gone wacko. And I know that's not a very popular word today, but I'm going to use it, wacko. In trying to please both these women, neither will be pleased. But to the surprise of the court, one woman is pleased. She likes this. And the other woman is just very much displeased. She does not like this. First Kings 3.26 tells us, Then spake the woman whose, living, whose the living child was unto the, the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son, and she said, Oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. And the other said, <laughs> Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Cut it up. Now, here's the thing. Even if she's the true mother, she doesn't deserve to be the true mother. <laughs> that baby is still very safely a better, the better choice would be to give it to the other woman. Even if that is her, but it isn't. Okay. She, what had just happened? She exposed her hard heart. The reaction of the second woman is astounding. Only a person with a truly hard heart would rejoice over the murder of an innocent baby. But that's another sermon. Only a vindictive woman would be pleased to have a child ripped apart. But that's another one, sir. But the reaction of the second woman is so sweet. Only a mother with a tender heart would rather be separated from her baby than to have her baby separated. Only a gentle woman would rather suffer the pain of losing her son than to bring pain to her son. Only a good mother would be selfless enough to give her son away so that he may live. Only a good mother would do such things. This story gives evidence that a bad woman can still be a good mother. But a bad mother cannot be a good woman. I'll let you chew on that for a while. After Solomon has the first woman expose her hard heart, King Solomon's judgment is easy. Any woman who will allow a baby to be divided in half is not the true mother. And any woman who would rather suffer a great injustice, you know, this woman's done nothing wrong. She, she would rather suffer a great injustice by giving up her child than to see harm come to that baby. She must be the true mother. As I mentioned before, God includes this story in uh, his Old Testament as a testimony to King Solomon's wisdom. And because of this, we're told that all of Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. This story, in other words, had legs, and it spread. Everyone knew this tale. That's the end of the story, by the way. And with this story in mind, let's ask ourselves a few questions. Number one, which are we? Are we the first woman who acts selfishly, or are we more like the second woman who acts selflessly? Are we individuals who have open hearts to the truth, or are our hearts so hardened that we, we're closed off to the wisdom of God? Is there confusion in our lives? If so, then the devil must be afoot. And most importantly, has there been a time when we've accepted the Lord as our Savior because he can make all this sort of foolishness and the selfishness and all this hard-heartedness and all this confusion just disappear?
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this wonderful story of King Solomon, his wisdom. Of course, it wasn't his wisdom. It was your wisdom in him. May we all be having under, one understanding and wisdom within us, Lord. Uh, Lord, may we just learn from this that, you know, even though this woman uh, suffered such a great trauma and, 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 and losing her baby, Lord, the way she did, uh, and she did something despicable. May we have pity on, on this, this type of person who feels that there's no other choice but to do something like this and may we just feel sorry for her and lord may we know that you would forgive her you would forgive anyone who would make such a rash uh choice in, in such a such a situation lord we know that you love us despite ourselves you love solomon you gave him wisdom despite his great sins with these all these women that he that he had lord and we know if you can love him you can love us and you can love you can be with us and and forgive us and just give show us mercy because uh, we know of your great love. It is spoken here every week at this church as we talk about how much you loved us to send your son to die on the cross for us. And Lord, we are so grateful for that. And Lord, as we close this service, may we be especially grateful for the women in our lives, those, uh, whether they be our mothers or not, those who taught us things, those who prayed for us, those who wished us well. May we just honor them and think of them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song, He is Lord, and then we'll, be clo we'll close in prayer. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here today. Happy Mother's Day. Brother Mike, please close our service with prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to come to your house and hear your message that you had prepared for us. We give you thanks for the opportunity to sing praises unto you. Lord, we ask a special blessing upon all of our mothers and all the women in our lives that have been there for us. We ask that you keep us safe this coming week and until we come together again. In Lord's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mike. Thank you for coming here to dismiss. Don't forget to get yourself a cozy before you leave.